about some keen gardeners amongst us this morning, but even if there aren't, I'm sure somebody can tell me what sort of tree this is. Right. Okay. Yes, I think we're okay. Can everybody see that? Yeah. So can, who can tell me what sort of tree this is? It's a green tree. Thank you, Brian. I'm, I'm pleased somebody's... So, come on, somebody... An olive tree. Thank you very much. It is an olive tree. And as I prepared for today's sermon, I asked the Lord what he wanted me to preach about. What Bible passages. However... He started to draw my attention to olive trees. I'd be working in somebody's house and start to notice them in all sorts of places. In fact, who's actually got one? One, two, three. Quite a few people have got olive trees. So it made me ask the question, what is the significance of the olive tree in Scripture and how can the Lord use it to speak to us today? And what I discovered was a large number of references and deep significance to olives, olive branches and olive trees. On searching the scriptures, I discovered around 58 references to olives. So I felt the Lord really wanted me to speak about and ask the question, what is the significance of the olive tree in scripture and how we can be changed and challenged by some of those Bible passages? So another question for you this morning. Can anyone tell me a Bible reference to olives, olive branches or olive trees. And there is a prize for the person who can give me the actual scripture reference. I need two. And who's going to be brave? Silence. Right, just give me a... Anybody got any idea where there's a reference to olives, olive trees or an olive branch? Right, Mary's got Romans 11. Thank you, that's one. One point to you, Mary. You're going to win the prize. Do you want to know? Uh, Liz? Genesis what? The flood. That's, that's good. That's one to you, Liz. Anybody else? If you can get two, either of you two, you can have the prize. Or shall I make you share the prize? Well, have I got two of these? I'm sure I can find two. I'm going to make Liz and Mary both the winners because you're all very quiet. So what I've got here... Ah, I'll get you another one, Liz or Mary. I've got some, some olives. Now, I did try and get some Israeli olives, but the closest I could get were olives from St Michael's. <laughs> OK, so they're as good as anything. Um, olives from St Michael's. So let me just bring these down to you. These just aren't just normal olives. These are extra juicy St. Michael's olives. There you go, Mary. I'll get you some. I like these. You like those? I thought you did. I had a feeling you were going to win somehow, Mary. So a little background information about the olive tree. Firstly, it's one of the most frequently mentioned plants in the Older Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. In, and in the book of the New Covenant, the Newer Testament. The olive tree is common in Israel, useful, highly valued, and significant to the Jewish people and to us too. It's a multi-branched, evergreen plant with a knotted trunk, with smooth, ash-coloured bark, with silvery-green, leathery leaves. They can get very old, often over 100 years old, and when they've reached their maximum production, farmers will cut them down to improve future growth and new shoots will appear from the stump and the plant starts producing olives again. And I'm sure you can see the biblical imagery here already. An example is Isaiah 11, 1 and 2. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse and a branch from his root shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Cultivated olive trees, when mature, can grow to six metres or more, 
producing small white or yellow flowers in early May. When the blossom begins to fall, the olives, the fruit of the tree, begin to develop. At the start, the fruit is green, but they gradually turn a, dirt, a, turn a deep blue-black or dark green colour when ripened and are ready to harvest. It's an extremely slow-growing tree which requires years of patient labour to reach its full fruitfulness. And it's the outer, the fleshy part of the fruit, which produces the highly valued olive oil. Olive trees were important in Israel for many things. For food, Nehemiah 9.25 says this, And they captured fortified cities and a rich land and took possession of houses full of all good things, cisterns already hewn, vineyards, olive orchards, and fruit trees in abundance. So they ate and were filled and became fat and delighted themselves in your great goodness. For lamp oil, Exodus 27, 20, you shall command the people of Israel that they shall bring to you pure beaten olive oil for the light, that a lamp may regularly be set up to burn. For anointing oil, when Jehu was anointed king over Israel in Kings 9. Then take the flask of oil and pour it on his head and say, Thus says the Lord, I anoint you king over Israel. And in Solomon's temple, 1 Kings 6.23, in the inner sanctuary he made two cherubim of olive wood, each ten cubits high. When we look in the Newer Testament, Olive oil is used for medicine, Luke 10, 34, in the parable of the Good Samaritan. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And healing, in James 5, 14. Is anyone sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And there is a spiritual significance in the process by which olives are crushed and beaten to produce the oil. Jesus was beaten and crushed on the cross so that the Holy Spirit might be poured out on the church at Pentecost. There are no coincidences in Scripture and it can't be a coincidence that Jesus' agonising prayer just before he was arrested in Gethsemane was in a place where there are many, many olive trees and whose name means olive press. Well, of those 58 references, I'd like to focus on three Bible passages today that mention olive branches and olive trees and provide us with three lessons from the Scriptures. And, and two have already been mentioned this morning. Firstly, Genesis 8, 6 to 11, which is part of the flood account. Here we find new beginnings that can challenge us about having a fresh new start with Jesus. Secondly, Zechariah 4, Zechariah's fifth vision. The challenge for us here is not to rely on our own strength, but to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. And thirdly, Romans 11, 16 to 24, well known to many of us, and about us Gentile believers being grafted into Israel. It's about assurance and challenges us about who and what we are rooted into. So three Bible passages that speak to us about olive branches and olive trees. So let's start with Genesis, Genesis 8, 6 to 11. And I'm going to read from the ESV, but it will come up on the screen, but you will also find them in your church Bible as well. So Genesis 8, 6 to 11. At the end of the 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made and sent forth a raven. It went to and fro until the waters had dried up from the earth. Then he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove found no place to set her foot and she returned to him to the ark for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark with him. 
he waited another seven days and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came back to him in the evening and behold in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. Then he waited another seven days and sent forth the dove and she did not return to him any more. Now I know there are some in the church today who don't even believe in a literal reading of Genesis. In fact, I understand some churches sadly ignore or spiritualise Genesis up to chapter 12, where we find the call of Abraham. So before I say anything else, I want to say that I believe that the Genesis account is a literal interpretation of creation, including the story of Noah and a worldwide flood. The context of this passage is that the world was in a mess. There was increasing corruption as men began to multiply. Children of men were bearing children from the Nephilim, something you will need to do your own research into to what they are. And God saw the wickedness of men and his judgment fell. The flood came and just righteous Noah and his family, along with the animals, were saved in the ark. God blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground. Man and animals, creeping things, and birds of the heaven. But God remembers Noah, his covenant, and there is a turning point in the story as the waters start to abate. But it's the dove and the olive leaf in verse 11 I want to focus on. What is the Lord saying to us through these verses in the image of the olive branch? Well, the olive branch here is a symbol of reconciliation and peace. When the dove brought Noah a freshly picked olive leaf in her mouth, it represented new life and growth sprouting upon the earth. The olive tree was alive and growing. There was the promise of a fresh new start for humanity, reconciliation and peace with God, renewal and revival. So isn't the olive branch here an image of the gospel we should be proclaiming? That in despite of our sins and wickedness that are deserving of death and separation from God, we can have reconciliation and peace with God through Jesus' death on the cross in our place and a new beginning. The lesson from the flood account and the returning dove with the olive branch in her mouth is surely a picture to us of the opportunity we have for a fresh new start with Jesus if we repent and turn to him. The challenge is have we individually accepted that fresh new start with Jesus? So to my second Bible passage, Zechariah chapter 4 verses 1 to 14. Zechariah 4, verses 1 to 14. And the angel who talked with me came again and woke me, like a man who is awakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, What do you see? I said, I see and behold a lampstand, all of gold, with a bowl on top of it, and seven lamps on it, with seven lips on each of the lampstands that are on the top of it. And there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on the left. And I said to the angel who talked with me, What are these, my lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? I said, No, my lord. Then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forward the top stone amid shouts of grace, grace to it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice, 
and shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These seven are the eyes of the Lord, which range through the whole earth. Then I said to him, Who are these two olive trees on the right and left of the lampstand? And a second time I answered and said to him, These are the two branches of the olive trees, which are beside the two golden pipes from which the golden oil is poured out. He said to me, Do you not know what these are? I said, No, my Lord. Then he said, These are the two anointed ones, who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Now this sounds like a heavy and deep chunk of prophetic scripture, and it is. It's got a huge amount of imagery, not only here in Zechariah, but also its connection with Revelation 11, 3 and 4, but you need to take a look at that as well. However, what is the context here? This is the fifth prophetic vision of Zechariah and consists of a solid golden lampstand or menorah that stood in the temple and which can symbolise God's faithfulness and power to fulfil his promises to David's house, represented by Zerubbabel. Others commenta- other commentators suggest it could also symbolise the people of Israel or symbolise the presence of God, but whichever this symbolises, the lampstand is flanked by two olive trees. Verse 2. I see and behold a lampstand all of gold with a bowl on top of it and seven lamps on it with seven lips on each of the lamps that are on top of it. And there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on the left. The lampstand supports a bowl which serves seven lamps. And while it's not clear how the two olive trees on either side of the lampstand are connected to the bowl, it suggests their function is to transmit the fuel, the olive oil, from the inexhaustible source of the two olive trees to the bowl of the lampstand, ensuring the lamps will never go out. Now Zerubbabel, the governor, is ultimately responsible for rebuilding the temple, but is forbidden to trust in the resources of man to accomplish the task. God's word to him is a reminder that the obstacles that face him in the, real be- in the rebuilding task will not be overcome by re- conventional resources of might and power. Instead, the resources will come from out- an outpouring of God's Holy Spirit. Verse 6 says, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. So how does this passage speak to us? Well, here in Zechariah, in the Zechariah passage, the Holy Spirit is represented by the oil from the olive trees. And like Zerubbabel, we aren't to trust in our own strength. We're not to trust in money, not to trust in church leaders, we're not to trust in the inaccurate reporting of the BBC or any other earthly resource, which of course is idolatry, but rather in the power of God's Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, within us. We need to ask for that fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit, that fresh and inexhaustible supply of oil. Zechariah 4 challenges us to be committed to holiness, to live exclusively for God, in the way he has instructed, to depend on the Holy Spirit to accomplish the things God has called each one of us to do, and be assured that what God has begun, he will complete in triumph. So the olive tree and its olive oil is the Holy Spirit. The challenge to us here is not to rely on our own strength, but to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit Are we ready to press in, receive the Holy Spirit and rely on him today? Finally, there's the the assurance of Romans 11, 17 to 24, which speaks directly to us who are Gentile believers. The New Testament mentions olive trees three times, once in Revelation, which I've already mentioned, and twice here in Romans. Romans 11 
16 to 24 says this. If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off and you, though a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant towards the branches. If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true, they were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. But if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and severity of God. Severity to all those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted, contrary to nature, into a cultivated olive tree, how much more would these, the natural branches, be grafted back in to their own olive tree? So what does it mean to be a wild olive shoot, to be grafted in and to share in the nourishing root of the olive tree? What challenge is the Lord presenting us? Two illustrations are used here to teach the same truth. The first fruits and the root refer to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, and the saving promises given to them. If the first fruits and the root are consecrated to God, so too is the whole stump and the branches the Jewish people. And this illustration is elaborated upon in verses 17 to 24, when the people of God are portrayed as an olive tree. Saul in Hebrew, or Paul, as we know him in his letter to the Romans, goes on to say that some branches were removed, perhaps referring to some of the Jews of his day. Although God did not uproot the tree, but that the Gentiles, us, a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in to the cultivated olive tree and now share the root and promises made to the patriarchs. But Gentiles believers are warned against arrogance. For God, for it is God's saving promise, the root, not our own goodness that saves us. And we also need to be careful we don't take this out of context, as some do in the church today, thinking they are the new Israel. While it is true that Paul describes the nations being grafted in to a metaphoric olive tree, this image does not suggest that non-Jews are now Israel. Paul, in his letter to the Romans, proclaims that the Gentiles share the blessings of God alongside Israel, but not instead of Israel. We therefore are grafted into the olive tree and into the root that is secure and unmoving, into the promises of the patriarchs, those saving promises. What hope and assurance this passage gives us and what a glorious illustration the olive tree provides us with. As branches grafted in, Gentile believers will only bear fruit if we are attached. The olive tree can be a continuing reminder of the source of our life, our branch springing from the Jewish root. No root, no fruit. The beautiful illustration of the olive tree reminds us of God's amazing plan of salvation and his expectations that all his branches will bear fruit in abundance. My third challenge here is do we believe it and the implications of it. So as I bring this into land today, what lessons have we learnt from the olive tree? 
How has this beautiful tree, how has this beautiful tree challenged us in the scriptures today? Firstly, olives and olive trees are mentioned many times throughout the scriptures. That's significant. In our first passage from Genesis 8, 11 to 16, the olive branch speaks to us of new life, peace and reconciliation. Having a fresh new start with Jesus if we accept him as our Lord and Saviour. Secondly, in the prophecy of Zechariah, there is the challenge to not to rely on our own strength, but to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit, that never-ending olive oil. Not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. Let's call upon the Holy Spirit to provide that power to fill and renew us today. Thirdly, in Romans 11, 16 to 24, the olive tree illustrates the hope and assurance we have in being grafted into the promises made to the patriarchs. Those saving promises, justification by faith, the promise of eternal life and being adopted and born into the family of God. We are certainly firmly rooted. Do we believe it? Finally, something practical for us today. James 5, 13 to 16 says this, and we've already mentioned this already. Is anyone amongst you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him in, with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. Interesting. And pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. There are many of us who are suffering in many ways at the moment in body, mind and in spirit. And I sense the Lord press upon me that we were to pray for each other this morning. As we gather in small groups, we can gather in small groups, that sickness is driven far from us and we have much restoration and healing. And if anybody this morning would like to be anointed with olive oil for healing, then please indicate as we pray in our groups together. And Dozy, or somebody else will come to you and anoint you with oil today. So I'm just going to give this oil to Daisy. She's kept safely in the vestry, I understand, Daisy. Yeah. Which will you need? So let's pray together. And then I'll invite you to get into small groups just to, to pray for each other. And just remember that James passage. We pray, Lord, for healing in this house today. May prayers offered in faith and anointing oil this morning make those who are prayed for and anointed healthy and strong, with sickness and dr disease driven far away. May prayers offered in faith and oil set apart right now for holy and consecration purposes bring down your glory and your miracles. Wherever it is laid, may it turn darkness to light and sickness into healing. May there be wonderful restoration and fruitfulness in this place today. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So let's pray together. I'm going to invite you, you're going to have to move around.